it's very easy to penalize you now financially or otherwise to be stopped from expressing certain views. Privacy is more like a, a privilege and not a human right anymore. The coin gave us that opportunity to own our own money. I actually see Lightning opening up a whole different plethora of opportunities. The Lightning Network opens up numerous opportunities, particularly to service the unbanked, where people are earning in Bitcoin and spending in Bitcoin. Immediately removes the need, first of all, to go to an exchange to buy and it removes the need as well to change it back into fiat because you're spending it in sats. You will have full-scale financial inclusion and that full-scale financial inclusion will help deal with a lot of the transactional issues that you face on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you want a peer-to-peer -peer electronic form of money that preserves privacy and that, that doesn't require a third party to transact? It's really interesting when we talk about uh, Bitcoin, there's always this topic and maybe that's a good avenue to, to start today with, with privacy because I saw you, you made some, some topics and some articles around that also. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel like that privacy uh, could be preserved uh, with Bitcoin? It seems like Bit the privacy topic is more like a... Uh, a privilege and not a human right anymore. It's like we, we kind of have to fight for our privacy. Um, do you think that, uh, or how do you think that Bitcoin could help us to preserve our privacy? That's a very, very big question. And I will answer it in sections. So first and foremost, like you rightly pointed out, privacy is definitely being massively attacked um, currently in various ways whether it's online in terms of how much information that um, gets leaked from your devices when you're browsing on, whether it's on social media or just, you know, your normal day-to-day -day browsing, how much of your personal identifiable information do you need to get online? So in some countries, when you buy a phone, for example, you need to actually register your ID proof of residence. So there will always be like um, something to trace back your browsing activity or your online activity to your real identity. Um, and when you extrapolate that, let's say, into the land of digital, digital payments, um, when you think of platforms like PayPal and platforms of that nature, or even your normal day-to-day -day bank accounts, again, you still come back to the whole same thing where you are KYC before you get access to those services and the certain information that you have to surrender to quote-unquote prove that you are who you say you are. But at the same time, what that does is it gives all of this information into the hands of these um, institutions and they're then able to sort of develop a digital, um, you can call it a digital map or digital footprint of whether of your transactions, your digital transactions, or even your browsing activity. So if we take, if we put Bitcoin aside and if we just stick to the way things are currently, you can see that with a lot of the technologies or let me say platforms, they are not privacy preserving first. So they focus on other factors that require some sort of um, exchange or some sort of, um, what can I call it, uh, verification of your identity, whether through a phone number, through an ID, through some sort of picture, something to prove that you are who you say you are. And as we get to a point in the world where you have let's say, things that you might disagree with or things that you might feel are not necessarily in line with your values, it's very easy to penalize you now financially or otherwise to get you to ex stop from ex stop to be stopped from expressing certain views as well as to kind of whip you into line, so to speak. So... If we did not have something like Bitcoin, right? Whilst we know that Bitcoin in and of itself is not private by default or by design, but at the same time, it gives us a platform from which to build new financial systems, new ways of trading and transacting, 
new applications that are not necessarily KYC first and things that would allow us to trade, communicate, transact, and so on and so forth in ways that are mutually beneficial, but that can allow us to protect our identity. So that's kind of how I believe that Bitcoin could serve as something that could be used to protect our privacy or at least to preserve it in some way. Yeah. It's also interesting so, for me when we talk about identity and privacy, um, it seems like all those institutions uh, own our data, mm -hmm. which is uh, so normalized that like Facebook owns our data, the doctor owns our medical data, the, 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 they, don't, they have access to it and you have to ask them to get your own medical data from them. Uh, so it's it's kind of weird weird situation that we are in and i would love to for us to have the data for us to own the data mm. and we can give access to the data if necessary for example like in maybe it makes sense for certain types of goods to only be able to buy it from a certain age for example alcohol in a supermarket uh you can just like uh prove like oh yeah i'm 18 plus or something like that and mm -hmm. they don't get like the birth date from that but they just like get a verification that you're actually over 18 so i think a lot has to happen in in I don't know how to call it identity management uh, yeah. and and things like that and also like with with bitcoin uh with payments uh it would be amazing to have uh, privacy in layer two which is where you own your uh bitcoin where you own your money and then also you can decide who can see your data and who's cannot. So like i feel like that's a a big big part of the future and without that um i feel like we we don't even have free speech without that like if we don't have that i couldn't agree more um and i would kind of also take that a step further to say that there are definitely there's definitely need for more innovation and more platforms to be built that are one privacy preserving but two, that would allow you to prove that you are who you say you are, or at least in a way to own your own data, kind of like what Noster does, where it gives you that opportunity, where by having your public key and private key attached to a particular NPUB, you are able then to verify or to use that as, you know, kind of a decentralized identity of sorts. And at the same time, even if you are posting stuff that um, a particular Gnostic client might not be, let's say, on board with, you still get to retain control of your data and control of your information. So that is definitely something that I believe the next, um, you could say the next wave of the internet, which includes Bitcoin and everything else around it, definitely requires, because without that, especially now that um, you can see how things are shaping up politically, globally, where the world seems to be getting more and more polarized along different topics. And depending on which side is in power, um, the other side, it becomes very easy for you to be marginalized and targeted and penalized and all these other different things that can actually happen. Further to that, I also believe that in order to maximize your own individual sovereignty, things need to get to a point where Bitcoin gave us that opportunity to own our own money. And unfortunately, I would say to a degree, some of the, if you think of, say, Bitcoin exchanges as an example, they came in to kind of provide a market where people could buy and sell Bitcoin. But at the same time, they then made it easy for stuff like KYC to then become, you know, to be put right in the center of it. So it gradually became a choke point for eroding that privacy when it was designed to be a pseudonymous type currency, where even though in its design, it wasn't like privacy first, like some of the other quote unquote privacy coins that are out there. But at the same time, with pseudonymity, 
there wasn't supposed to be some, at least the way I understood it, or at least from the way I look at it, there never needed to be any point through which when you were, let's say, signing up for a wallet or transacting, since it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, where you needed to have anything that was attached to your identity. So when then this changed, particularly with the coming in of exchanges and other services that in order to function, let's say, in a more fiat world, required that those KYC processes to happen. I think that became perhaps what you could say um, an area of concern through which certain attacks could then be um, could then be levied on, um, let's say, people within the Bitcoin space should the need be. So from that perspective, I would actually argue, or at least put across the um, thought process to say, these are some of the things that we sort of, as we build, and even as new products come online, we need to also kind of think about that. How do we build privacy preserving technologies, whether it's layer one, layer two, how do we ensure that people can still access and use Bitcoin, whether it's buying or selling it, where you don't have any sort of, you know, KYC required. And even when you look at a platform like Noster, it's great in the sense that it allows you to send zaps or at least for people to interact. And even though at this point, it's still, you know, tiny amounts of Bitcoin that are being exchanged depending with the process or depending with the reality. But I believe that it can get to a point where it evolves into proper marketplace where certain trade, bigger things can be traded or bigger programs or applications can be built on top of it or leveraging the protocol itself to then allow KYC free services that are also privacy preserving to be built. And I think that that would be actually the most ideal way because currently I don't see any feasible way in which you can have some sort of interaction with the present fiat systems or with present web 2.0 technologies, which where you can then interact with them privacy free through and through, or like in a very private manner through and through, they've made it extremely difficult, not to say it's impossible, but it has become extremely difficult to navigate your way through a lot of those platforms and applications where you don't need to dox yourself in some way. And I like the example that you gave about, let's say you need to go buy something or to verify, let's say your age or that sort of stuff, but without necessarily doxing your entire identity where it's provable that yes, this is um, an individual who is above 18 years of age, if that's a requirement, let's say at a liquor store or anything of that sort, but not necessarily without exposing your identity or any other sensitive information, um, which can be in this age of hackers stolen and then, you know, exploited in many different ways. And identity theft is also a real risk, which I guess a lot of us might not think about, but there are real markets where, you know, all of these things are exchanged and it leaves you vulnerable, particularly if you have bank accounts that have large sums of money within them or things that um, are very private that you would want to stay private. So I look at privacy and identity kind of as one thing in the same bucket where it's very difficult to separate the two, where you would have complete privacy or the maximum amount of privacy that you can have without control over your identity or vice versa. Yeah. Absolutely. I, that's, that's really, a, I think there are a lot of good insights in there. And uh, it's also interesting for me how we may be able to build those technologies on top of Bitcoin and connect it all with that protocol of money. Uh, do you see Lightning, the Lightning Network, as the, the main solution there? Or are, are you also looking at like different uh, Fediments at ARCs, uh, the ARC protocol and other things? Uh, what are you most excited about the, the la uh, la layer two solutions? <laughs> I like that question. 
Yes, Lightning, I think it's definitely one of those um, solutions because it allows a lot of things to happen. First and foremost, it allowed us to reduce the cost of, you know, day-to-day transacting, like going to the grocery store, buying a cup of coffee and, you know, those normal day-to-day activities that you would do. And it then opens up the market to build additional services that would allow Say, for example, something, let me use an example like um, airline miles, right? Where normally in the fiat world, you know, if I have this kind of debit card or if I'm with this bank, I can access, depending with the type of bank account that you have, if I go to the airport, I can have access to that airport lounge. I can have access to, I can bank my frequent flyer miles this way, or I can earn points if I use this particular airline that is partnered with um, my bank and so on and so forth. So you've got these reward programs that you can actually utilize in real life that can then eventually save you money or give you certain benefits that you may not have access to at a particular point in time. So what the Lightning Network work enabled is for those kind of things, reward programs, whether on airline miles or other shopping points or other reward programs to be built. It also allows for other markets and other economies as well to come into play. Um, Like one of the things I've been really looking into also because of my kind of professional experience and background in crop insurance in how you can have, you know, something like the Lightning Network or how the Lightning Network it then enables different financial applications to be built, let's say within banking, within insurance, the normal day-to-day things that people would want that they would not necessarily be able to get. So I actually see Lightning opening up a whole different um, plethora of opportunities out there. And even when you think of something like... um, the current flavor of the moment, AI, where you've got different, um, where there's different LLMs coming into play or different kind of AI applications being built. Or if you want to be, to extend your mind all the way into the future, um, where you can think of things like machine to machine payments, where different AI programs are paying each other via APIs and all of that other stuff. These are the things that, I believe that the Lightning Network would definitely become the best killer application for within uh, particularly where AI is concerned, where a lot of the services are going to necessarily require, let's say, microtransactions that can happen, whether it's an API call or a request for certain services or for machines to pay for particular services that they would use. I can't see any other solution working of course i'm not necessarily a technical person myself so (laughs) that's there's that to bear in mind but based on the research and the limited information at least that i've come across so far i don't see fiat payments doing a great job in that space because of all the kind of expenses that are associated with it and i don't see any other quote unquote coin or chain being in a position to handle that. So I actually believe that um, the Lightning Network, even for some of those applications that are yet to be built around in that space, whether we're talking AI or even now where we, I, I mentioned reward programs, those do exist now in the Bitcoin space, but they're kind of in their infancy. But we will see a lot of those things grow. And as you start to have a lot of those things being built on top of the Lightning Network and um, incorporating or integrating Bitcoin in some way, shape or form, I think that um, Lightning becomes a very, very important technology and a very, very important um, layer too, that I would say the sky is the limit. I love that. (laughs) The sky is definitely the limit. Or maybe not even the sky. Maybe the sky isn't even the limit. (laughs) Or maybe the sky is where it all begins. (laughs) Absolutely. 
uh, that, that might be true. That might be true. Yeah. It's also uh, interesting for me um, what Layer 2 and the Lightning Network can do, especially with Bitcoin, uh, mm -hmm. for the unbanked. Me as an Austrian, and my colleagues in Austria don't understand that because mm -hmm. in Austria, we have a bank rate of like 99.5% or something like that. Everyone has a bank account. So that's mm -hmm. why people here, uh, when they think about the use case of Bitcoin, they're like, yeah, it's a store of value. It's something where my financial energy goes up over time. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at other countries where the banking rate is 70%, 50%, or even lower than 50, maybe 30%, 20%, whatever, uh, depends on where in the world you are. I think the Lightning Network right now is already an amazing bank account uh, and it's it's uh, it's cost free and it's 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 amazing um uh you are you're in africa right uh yeah. so how do you think is is that going right now what do you see in in that impact uh one of the layer two for for the financial inclusion that i probably don't see a lot but it's all uh, interesting for me how, how this is going in in africa interesting interesting so yeah, um, definitely the Lightning Network opens up um, new, new, numerous opportunities, particularly to service the unbanked. And I don't know, I'm not, I can't think of a, a, an alternative term, but I've never really liked the term unbanked because it introduces the idea that you need a bank to sort of transact and to have like a financial life where when you think about the whole purpose of Bitcoin, it was really instituted to remove third parties or middlemen like banks. But for the lack of a better term, because I'm yet to invent one or someone else is yet to come up with, with a more interesting term. Um, I would say that it does give people a way to actually transact because there are parts of Africa, where you have people that have a, have a hard time accessing things like a government ID or accessing something, you know, some sort of identification, which becomes necessary to open a bank account. So that's one problem. You also have people that are not formally employed. So they don't have, let's say, a letter, a contract of employment or a payslip through which when they're going to open a bank account, you would need, it's part of what you would need to produce either um, to prove that you have some sort of income um, that can then sustain a particular bank account. So when you have to, especially in problems where it's very kind of the extreme side, where you have those two problems coinciding, where someone can't access, not because they don't know how to access or they don't have the ability to, but it's just so cumbersome in some countries to just get something as simple as uh, a government issued ID. It takes a long time. It's not the story for the whole African continent, obviously, but there are countries like that where you do have that problem, particularly in regions perhaps where the, they are like war-torn regions or where you have people that are escaping conflict, that are refugees, the whole identity thing might actually be a problem for them, especially in their host country where they'll now need some sort of um, mechanisms and means to transact. Of course, we also know that there are some sort of solutions and workarounds that have been built, at least in this area where we discuss refugees, but obviously they are not perfect. So when you think about all these different use cases, and in some instances, it has nothing to do with people's inability to access, say, IDs of sorts, where they do have the IDs, but they're just in a place where the banking system is just so expensive that it makes sense to operate on a cash basis. For them, given their levels of income, they wouldn't. it wouldn't be prudent for them to go and open a bank account where you have a certain amount of... Um, um, fees being levied or charged on your account every other month. And perhaps that's probably, if you're living on, let's say, a couple of bucks per day, those fees could mean the difference between having a meal today and not eating anything at all. So in those types of scenarios and in those types of setups, 
And for some, it's really a, a question of maybe education. They just um, prefer to still operate on a cash basis. They don't have functional institutions. They live in regions where the banks are so far away and with limited connectivity to the internet and even some of them without access to, say, smartphones where you can do online banking and all of these things. So these are just a myriad of problems just to sort of um, broaden up the scale and to broaden up the understanding, particularly for people that may not be familiar with some of the issues on the ground to sort of understand from which side you end up with having different people being unbanked. That on one side, it could be a case of inability to access government issued IDs. On another side, it could be, well, the banks are too far away, so you would need maybe a bus or uh, to travel to the nearest um, shopping center or some sort of banking institution. And even that being the fact that with a lot of these people, they're probably living below the poverty line, that becomes unsustainable. And for some, it's just a simple mistrust of financial institutions and the whole banking system. So they prefer to do, it's merely a choice. They prefer to do everything cash. Regardless of which of which bucket one would fall in on the continent, I believe that um, something like Lightning or at least Bitcoin coupled with the Lightning Network would actually give a lot of these people a mechanism and a means to then start to transact and trade within the 21st century economy and um, even get to a point where some of them, particularly those that are, say, somewhat artistic, they can put some of their wares online, sell them online and have a way to get paid. Because without a bank account, these people are shut off totally from the entire online economy in as much as that could be something that could be of benefit to them that they could utilize to lift themselves out of poverty, to provide a better life for their uh, families, and even to access certain key essential services where they need it, obviously, like, say, medical insurance, medical aid, or different types of financial products, let's say, if they want to start a business, if they need some sort of credit extension, having access to, you know, something or an asset that would then have a whole different financial system built on top of it through which they can have loans, insurance, and life insurance, funeral cover, you name it, that would be quite helpful for a lot of them to actually deal with the problems that they face with on a day-to-day -day basis insofar as income generation is concerned. And insofar as transacting within the 21st century economy is concerned, because we do know that whilst cash has the benefit of being private, I mean, we started on a privacy note, it's very difficult to move cash over long distances, particularly in the as the world gets more and more digital. It shrinks your ability to trade and transact within your local community and around the people that you can access physically. So in order to transcend those natural and physical barriers, you would need a digital form of transacting. And definitely this is the gap. And this is the role that something like Bitcoin and um, via the Lightning Network as well, and different applications that will be built on top of it can then come in to then fulfill. So in Africa, I would actually say it's a, uh, there is massive, massive potential for the adoption of Bitcoin, even though we are yet to really see it at this point for various reasons, which we can get into. But um, the potential is there. And especially when you also then consider the fact that a lot of the currencies, like the fiat currencies in Africa are, for the lack of a better word, <laughs> they don't retain much value over a long period of time. So it's very difficult for people to save. It's very, they're very inflationary. And um, you also have a lot of the non-functional currencies coupled with high fees of transacting from the banking sector for those that do have access to bank accounts. 
coupled with all of these other issues that I've raised. So that presents, I would say, one of the best use cases that Bitcoin actually has in any, at least from a more, if we go back to the fundamentals of a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash systems, I believe that that green field from which you can start to implement certain applications or to see certain use cases coming online, we have a lot of them actually on the African continent. Beyond using it as a store of value, just yeah. the medium of exchange function that Bitcoin could provide in and of itself be, before we get to store value or trying to preserve um, your purchasing power. Just the fact of having something that is of a higher value, not necessarily shuffling people into dollars, which is basically what ends up happening when you have a failing fiat currency. The next best thing that a lot of people do is they start saving in dollars, which of course, amongst the fiat currencies, that's usually the best option, but it still brings you back to the same place where you are still having your purchasing power stolen, albeit much slower than you would with certain currencies, but stolen nonetheless. And you're still living within this control grid where you have a better form of currency, but you're still within the matrix of um, the fiat monetary system. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the Bitcoin Way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much it's it's something that um i don't know if it concerns me but I see it a lot in countries where they have a high inflation, like mm -hmm. Argentina, for example, Turkey, mm -hmm. for example, Africa, for example. Um, they don't go to Bitcoin. They first go to the US dollar. Mm. <laughs> and I mean, they are like, I, I don't know, like 60 or 70 countries that actually have a, a Bitcoin, a, a US dollar standard outside mm -hmm. of the US. So like uh, El Salvador was one of the countries. Now they're trying yeah. to switch to Bitcoin. Uh, but there are a lot of countries that are not in the US, but they use only the US dollar because yes. their own currency failed. Uh, they don't have any other currency. And then they're the completely bit dependent on the United States. And I'm just waiting for that moment where mm. those countries are finally waking up and like, hey, 
um, we, we actually don't want to be dependent on the United States. Like, how can we be un independent from them? And then they're like, oh, okay, maybe that Bitcoin thing is actually something that we have to do. I mean, Bhutan, El Salvador, and some other countries are already moving in that direction, but it's not a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it will definitely come. You also mentioned that uh, the, the challenges of the adoption of, of Africa and, and why this is, that might be an interesting topic where like, um, they are also more going towards the US dollars and, and uh, most have like this fear of like going directly to Bitcoin. Um, what, what do you think are the, the biggest challenges towards that? What are the big challenges for people not adopting uh, Bitcoin, especially now in Africa? One of the issues that I would say is probably the biggest challenges, particularly where that is concerned, has to do with the fact that First of all, you have a lot of scams that have come around using the word Bitcoin to the point that now when people hear the word Bitcoin, they immediately associate it with some of those pyramid scams or Ponzi schemes that maybe a brother-in-law has lost a shirt over or some sort of things like that. So there is that initial hesitancy to move to that because if most people's association or at least thought process when it comes to Bitcoin is that it's a scam, right? And of course, this is as a result of insufficient education and um, the inability to differentiate between what's real and what's not, right? Because obviously with some scams, they will talk about, oh, if you, you know, invest X amount of dollars, you will get your payouts in Bitcoin and so on and so forth. And then it turns out to be a rug pull. But because the word Bitcoin was exploited and used as the scam was marketed, it then throws the baby out with the bathwater. So that's problem number one that exists, that a lot of people associate Bitcoin with different scams that have been run in the past or even that are currently being run by different actors that still try to exploit or include Bitcoin in some way, shape or form in their scam. So that's problem number one. Problem number two that I would say exists would be the fact that there's also this issue of merchant adoption, right? Where you don't have as many merchants that accept it as a form of payment. So given the fact that the the price is always bouncing up and down what we would call volatility even though i would argue in a different direction against that but for the purposes of the at least where we are now in this discussion i would say that given that bitcoin is seen or deemed to be volatile if you don't have a mechanism through which you're going to spend it or a merchant that's going to sell you goods or services for Bitcoin, it means, therefore, that if you are to receive Bitcoin, you have to exchange it into some fiat currency. And if the price dips, let's say from 65 to 58, there goes whatever goods and services you are going to buy by the time you change it from whatever, how many sats you have received. The set numbers we know remains the same. If it's 50,000 sets, 50,000 sets. But if those 50,000 sets, let's say for argument's sake, if they were worth $100 and now they're worth 50, in the fiat world, it means that they're buying you less goods and services than they were maybe a couple of days ago or a couple of hours ago, depending on how recently that price dip would have happened. So part of the hesitancy to move straight to Bitcoin has to do with that that you don't have a lot of platforms or merchants that would be willing to accept goods in exchange for sats. If you had that, I believe perhaps some people would be willing to at least look into the idea much deeper and much further if they could go to their local grocery store and immediately buy goods with Bitcoin. In South Africa, the situation is a little bit different because there are platforms that you can use to actually where I can go to a local supermarket, buy things from my wallet. And obviously the merchant will get 
the money in fiat, but I would have used Bitcoin to pay for services. So the merchant doesn't even know that I'm paying him with Bitcoin, but at the same time, I, I still get access to goods and services. So in South Africa, amongst different, uh, the story is a little bit different where you do have such platforms and such applications that allow you to pay for most goods and services um, using Bitcoin. So merchant adoption is one. The third that I would also highlight would have to do with, say, smartphone access, where in certain parts of the continent, smartphone penetration isn't as ubiquitous as in other parts of the continent. So you do have people still utilizing feature phones that may not be able to download, let's say, a Bitcoin wallet. So in places like that and in regions like that, and added to that, you also have smartphones and connectivity. So if you have a person in a region where the connectivity isn't as good, and they're using a feature phone, you've got two problems to actually immediately deal with. One of which is a larger scale one because it has to do with internet and cell connectivity in the area, which if you're, say, a Bitcoin company, maybe that's not primarily uh, your immediate problem that you're looking to solve at that point in time. But at the same time, we do have, say, applications like Machankura, where it allows you to have a Bitcoin wallet using a USSD code, whether you're using a feature phone and or not, or a smartphone, you can still have like a Bitcoin wallet that you can use. So there are solutions coming on board, at least in that direction. But at present, Machankura is still rolling out in different African countries. It's not yet available in all the parts of the continent, but again, it's an ongoing project, it's improving. And it's such applications and innovations that we need more of that perhaps could then increase the um, levels of Bitcoin adoption coupled with more like merchant related adoption where you have merchants that are willing to sell products and services in exchange for SATs or maybe middlemen and intermediators that can come and make it possible where if somebody wants to pay in SATs, they're able to do that. And even if the person on the other end of the line wants to receive the money in fiat, the transaction can still happen. One is paying in SATs and one gets to receive their money in fiat. So these are some of the problems that I would say on a, and obviously education in terms of to deal with problem number one of the scams. A lot of people like they just hear, oh, there's this thing called Bitcoin. It's making everybody rich. Right. <laughs> but without necessarily understanding or going down or taking time to really figure out, OK, what is Bitcoin? What is it not? What is the difference between Bitcoin and um, all these other scams purporting to be Bitcoin? Or what is the difference between Bitcoin and, you know, other old coins that might where people have had different old coins or um, rug pull projects pitched to them where they're told this is just like Bitcoin, but if you buy this, this is actually cheaper than Bitcoin because it'll cost you $60,000 to buy Bitcoin, but this is just like 25 cents. So you would rather get into this and when the price rises, it will likely rise like Bitcoin, but this is your opportunity. You missed the boat on Bitcoin, but now you can get on into this at 25 cents a piece. And this is how a lot of people, because they don't understand the difference between these different um, projects or let's say between Bitcoin and everything else. So the scamming is on steroids when it comes to a lot of um, a lot of these factors and a lot of these projects. And um, you don't have as many circular economies or I believe that's perhaps the final solution where you would have a lot of these circular economies being built where people are earning in Bitcoin and spending in Bitcoin. So it immediately removes the need, first of all, to go to an exchange to buy because you're already receiving your earnings in Bitcoin. And it removes the need as well to change it back into fiat because you're spending it in sats. So there are people, um, Bitcoin, Ekasi, 
Um, the project based out of Mossel Bay here in South Africa. You've got others, Bitcoin, Victoria Falls up in Zambia, which are also doing education, where the ultimate goal is to get to a point where they are going to have these, these Bitcoin circular economies happening. And it's, a, it's still, I would say, early days for a lot of these projects. Some are obviously um, a bit ahead than others. We've got, again, in South Africa, Bitcoin Vitsant, which is like a small community, uh, a town of about, I believe, I got my numbers right, 500 to 1,000 people. But the Bitcoin adoption there is massive and the merchant adoption has happened on a much bigger scale. And within that town, you can actually transact in Bitcoin, you can tip in Bitcoin and um, with a, a whole lot of different um, things that happening that are happening along the line in between. So I believe these are some of the solutions that even remittances as well, because you also have a large section of the, of the African population within the diaspora that send money back home. And this is another, I would say, low-hanging fruit where you could use Bitcoin to also get people to adopt it in that um, regard. Yeah, just to name a few of the areas and a few of the potential solutions that could increase adoption on the continent. Oh, that's that's super interesting. Also, when 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 we when we talk about increasing adoption, I think there are a lot of. I think it all kind of boils down fundamentally to to education and and bring better knowledge also to to the people. Um, I'm curious on how CBDCs are uh, perceived uh, in in Africa. I know in Germany, Austria, and maybe also in America, but definitely mm -hmm. from Europe, I know it. Um, they are really afraid of them because everyone has a bank account, everyone is KYC, everyone has the government IDs, like everyone is very um, entrenched with the government system. Um, but it seems like maybe in Africa, they are not as afraid of CBDCs or maybe they don't see it that much because uh, the, 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 the bank and the government is a little bit further away from the people and not that much deep in the, in the, the privacy. So with CBDCs, Africa being as diverse as it is, you're going to, obviously, there are regions where no one is even thinking about them, where they, they are yet to even know what a CBDC is because they're still, they've got bigger problems. Let me, <laughs> let me put it like that. So the CBDC is not even something, at least if you're going to consider it from a, general population view, it's not the conversation happening at the dinner table in a lot of um, African countries or at the supermarket or at the cafes or wherever, right? It's not because a lot of them don't even have, some of them don't even have functional financial systems. And the flip side to that is it's in those regions that I think perhaps would become easier to capture for CBDCs because it would be very easy for, for the argument to be made that once we introduce a CBDC, we will have full-scale financial inclusion and that full-scale financial inclusion will help deal with a lot of the transactional issues that you face on a day-to-day -day basis. So in those places, I think that the concern is because Currently, it's not a conversation, it's not a topic of discussion because of the dysfunctional financial systems they have. But once someone comes and says, hey, here's a solution to, you don't have to go all the way to the, for like 50 kilometers away to get to the nearest bank, just download this application. In fact, before you just for downloading it, you're going to get uh, $10 for free, courtesy of the state that you can use to buy groceries. And I see that becoming like something that can be used to hook these, uh, at least people in these regions, particularly those that haven't really looked into what CBDCs are and what they're actually going to be implemented for. Then on the other side, 
you do have people where these conversations are happening, like Nigeria. They did roll out a CBDC, I believe, two years ago. And the adoption has been dismal, to say the least, which is good news. Um, they, the people did not respond positively, despite the different regulations and different um, incentives as well that were put as a way of getting them to kind of adopt the CBDC platform. I think they're close to shutting down that project if they haven't already because of the fact that the adoption didn't go as well as they had hoped or planned it was. And I think there they took a more calculated approach where they actually first had quote unquote problems with cash withdrawals. In a cash economy, that becomes a very big thing. So now imagine you've got cash limits and you've got issues getting cash to withdraw. Nigeria, they did roll out a CBDC and when they did roll it out, there were certain regulations that they passed as a way of trying to force people um, without saying it out front or up front that this is what's going on. But the adoption rate plummeted so bad that I believe that uh, last time I checked, there were reconsiderations to pull the plug on the project because no one is using it, no one is touching it. So I, I think that you do have, particularly given the fact that the Nigerian Naira as well, it's one of those currencies that also experiences a lot of fluctuations and it's not one of, it's not as stable as you would like. But even with that, it wasn't enough to convince people to use a CBDC. So I would basically say for the most part of Africa, um, once they understand what a CBDC is actually meant to do, most people are not for it. And I think it becomes, given the the way things are, uh, the financial infrastructure in a lot of countries, it would be very, it would not be as easy to roll out a CBDC in Africa as say within the EU or in the US or some of these places. But, Having said that, the education with regards to, or at least the knowledge with regards to what CBDCs are and the threats that they pose to personal freedom, and particularly the freedom to transact, most people aren't really aware of it. So the same issues, problems that we're talking about that um, created a financial exclusionary type economy or environment in on another side or from another side are kind of some of the reasons why the CBDC probably wouldn't work in Africa. Unless of course if you consider stable coins to be pseudo CBDCs, then that's a different um topic and discussion altogether. But generally speaking, I don't think that um central banks in this part of the world, even though you do have certain like I mentioned Nigeria and even the South African Central Bank was running experiments um, before with regards to rolling out uh, more like a cross-border wholesale CBDC. Um, I think they carried it out with the Central Bank the Monetary Authority of Singapore and one other central bank two years ago, I think it was called Project Dunbar, um, where they ran this experiment to see how it would be like to roll out a wholesale CBDC. So there are experiments that central banks on the continent are doing as to how that would be rolled out. But in terms of the grassroots adoption of it, I don't see it happening in any way, shape or form, given that in any case, it's a, most people actually still prefer to use cash with few exceptions where you have, you know, robust banking system. So it's either cash or mobile money. Other than that, yeah, it's, I would say we're still very far from a place where maybe 10, 15 years out, maybe 20, from where we can actually start to see a CBDC that works. I mean, Nigeria did roll it out, but didn't really work. Yeah. Absolutely. It's interesting, uh, CBDCs. It's, I think we are, 
I, I just hope that we can move from a normal fiat system directly to Bitcoin and don't have to Absolutely. go through like that CBDC uh, kind of a time. Uh, at least that's like my dream state. I mean, like CBDCs is just fiat money on steroids. So uh -huh. I just like uh, fiat money with like more uh, control in that. So I hope we, we can <laughs> avoid that to a certain extent. Um, yeah, really cool. Uh, I loved it a lot, uh, a lot already. Um, uh, one last question on that note, how do you think uh, Bitcoin will influence uh, uh, politics and governments and all, all those things uh, when they do all of a sudden don't have the ability to print as much money as they want without consequences? Because even mm -hmm. if fiat money is still around, um, Bitcoin represents an exit wealth. And if they print too much, all of a sudden the buying power goes to Bitcoin. So yeah. even if fiat is still around, Bitcoin will uh, put a pressure onto fiat and the states. What do you think will be the influence or the impact uh, on that? I, well, there, there are many ways to answer that question. First of all, it depends on the nature of Bitcoin adoption that happens, right? particularly if we are talking from a nation state perspective, because if you have an instance where let's assume for argument's sake, people will issue or certain countries, let's take the U S for example, let's say they were to issue Bitcoin backed dollars. The definition of Bitcoin backed, of course, that is up for debate. And, um, but let's just for argument's sake, um, for or at least try to visualize a scenario in which the U.S. government starts to issue Bitcoin-backed dollars, right? Or some variation of the sort. In a sense, you are still having fiat or the U.S. dollar moving around as we know it, but in, in its structure and in its uh, makeup, it's different because now allegedly it's Bitcoin-backed. So you're going to have certain countries that are not going to go straight up, you know, like the El Salvador route where Bitcoin in, in its purest form is used for transacting. Um, it's used for paying taxes. It's used for, it's considered to be legal tender. You're going to have maybe some nation states that will still try to hang on to their fiat for the purposes of political control and for the purposes of uh, trying to keep the promises either they made to previous generations in the form of pensions or to keep promises for whatever treaties that may have been signed, trade treaties, trade agreements, you name it. But those, the validity of those agreements or promises, if you like, depend on the government having that ability to control the money printer. So you will have instances where you have Bitcoin adoption in name only, and then people still trying to do the whole shenanigans, kind of like what you had with gold, right? Where initially how we got to fiat was, fiat was basically paper money acting as a gold receipt. And then eventually it got to where slowly but surely we eventually moved away from that. So I, will, I can actually foresee a scenario where you can have something similar like that happen, where there'll be some sort of... Um, attempt to cheat that um, 21 million supply cap and all of those other rules that come along with Bitcoin adoption. Because quite frankly, if you really think about it, for a country to go full blown on a Bitcoin standard, particularly where they have printed more money than value produced, which is most countries, and where they are heavily indebted, which is most countries again, how then do you balance the books if you say the, without doing like a hard cutback or reset of some sort? So the only way you're probably going to try to balance those books to make those things kind of match up is you're going to have kind of a pseudo Bitcoin standard as a way of one still trying to maintain confidence and say to everybody, hey, we are on a Bitcoin standard just like everybody else. What can we learn from you? besides Bitcoin? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. What can you learn from me besides Bitcoin? I would say... Lighting. 
besides Bitcoin. Um, writing is one of those things I really enjoy doing. And I've been told that my writing is great. Hopefully that wasn't a lie. <laughs> but um, assuming that to be true, <laughs> I think that's one of the things that um, you could learn from me because in, a, in and of itself, it's an art where you're just putting your thoughts on paper in a way that another person who's not in your mind can pick up that piece of paper, digital or otherwise, and read it and kind of read your mind from reading that piece of paper. So that's what I always strive to do when I write, to create a mirror image of in a, at a point in time where you timestamp it, that at this point in time or at block height such and such, this is what I was thinking and these were some of the ideas that I wanted to communicate. And this is how I chose to communicate them and lay them out. So definitely I would say the thing that immediately comes to mind for me would be writing. Although I'm not the best writer on the planet, but I do believe I'm moderately okay. Yeah, absolutely. Really cool. I think uh, writing is something very, um, it, it's very important, I feel like for the for the human brain to, to develop, um, especially if you do it like that, but even mm -hmm. like on the laptop and something like that is really, really cool. Then we have the end routine of the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And there's an interesting one, the, que the uh, previous guest asks you, uh, what will it take for you to walk away from Bitcoin? Um, the background to that and the context to that is, um, you always like, if we assume that we got Bitcoin and before we thought Bitcoin might be a scam, we discovered that we are wrong about something mm -hmm. and, uh, maybe we are also wrong about Bitcoin. How do we know what needs to happen that we know that we are actually wrong about Bitcoin? Like that's kind of the, the question from him. Okay. So. The question is, if let's assume we are wrong about Bitcoin, or let's assume, how would you know that you're wrong about Bitcoin? And then what level of being wrong would be enough for you to walk away? Is that the gist of the question? Okay. Wow. What a question. <laughs> I'll answer it from the end of it going backwards. Like I'll start with what would it take for me to walk away? What would it take for me to walk away from Bitcoin? I guess when it gets to a point where it's, if Bitcoin, let's say, does get captured in the same way fiat was captured, where all of the things that made it special, things like let's say the 21 million supply cap, if that was to be tampered with, um, let's say if we got to a point where once again, we went off of proof of work to something like um, proof of stake and where we ended up with, let's say some nodes, which would be kind of a build up to the previous point where not all nodes are equal and other nodes are more important, you know, than others. And I think once we get to a point where you have those kind of things in play, what you will have there is some sort of digital currency, or you could even argue a distributed CBDC but it won't be Bitcoin any longer once you remove those two components where it's no longer proof of work based and it's no longer, it doesn't have that 21 million supply cap. And I think those are hard lines for me that would be enough for me to call it quits. And like Satoshi to say, I'm moving on to other things, <laughs> even though the project is no longer in good hands, you know, type of thing. And how would we know if we're wrong? I think there is no one way. It depends on what we would define as being wrong, right? Are we wrong to want a peer-to-peer -peer 
electronic form of money that preserves privacy and that can that doesn't require a third party to transact. No, we are not wrong about that. Are we wrong to say that we have we need a trustless system? particularly where trust is continually violated by the people that we entrust to make the right decisions, whether they be central bankers, government officials, the list goes on and on. We are not wrong about that. I guess the one thing perhaps that we could potentially be wrong about is maybe the design of what Bitcoin looks like today given the threat levels that we are facing and given how the future is unfolding, maybe, I don't know, I doubt it, but that's the one area perhaps that I can foresee that we could potentially be wrong about, more about how Bitcoin exists today and how it is designed, which would lead some people to say, maybe let's remove the 21 million supply cap, let's tamper with the supply schedule, you know, let's uh, go over to a proof of stake type system and we are back to fiat once again. So the, uh, the philosophical underpinnings of Bitcoin, I believe, are intact and they're genuine and they're based in truth and they're based in a desire and a love for freedom. What might be wrong, if anything is wrong, might have to do perhaps with the current implementation of it, perhaps a better implementation would be required. I don't know, but this is just me speculating and, you know, playing with my mind and going into those places. That perhaps to me would be the signal that I would use to measure that. Yeah. Uh, really cool. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting uh, for me when you think about that question, but I think you you answered it really, really, really good. Um, then thank you so much. Uh, could a good side already for taking your time before i let you go where can people find you ask your questions uh, yeah. and read more about you at kudzai kutrukwa my name and surname is one and um i'm also on noster at kudzai um i i will send also the npub so that if need be you can include it in the show notes and i also write for bitcoin magazine you can also find a lot of my work there um, and on Freedom Tech as well. So those are, there are many other avenues that I utilize for writing, but those would be my main ones. And I will also include all the information as well in addition to those. But those are like the key places, particularly on Twitter. Twitter and Noster, those are the best places to reach me. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Kutsai, for joining us today. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.